Good to meet you, John. Oh, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm very interested in your story. I'm uh, a lot of cancel culture going around out there. Talk to a lot of guys who started businesses. Uh, talk to the uh, fella who started. Um, oh God, I'll I'll think of it in a second. Sure, my brain's not working. It's a little bit early, but uh, uh, CrossFit. The right, CrossFit right, right, right. guy, right. he's a funny guy. He started a business and at some point got pushed out of his own business. Now, he told me it's the best thing ever happened to him. He just mm -hmm. cashed out, got off the treadmill, and led his life. So let's talk about you. First off, philosophically, how do you feel? Yeah, I feel probably as better uh, as good as I've ever felt in my whole life. Um, I was ready to retire. I had a succession plan in place. Um, things were going well. We took the stock from six eighty a share to ninety bucks. We were past five thousand stores. There was nothing really left to prove. So I was ready to step back December of seventeen to let uh, our succession plan Steve Ritchie and his team come in and run the show. So I was ready to go as far as um, just work ethic hours in the day. I mean, when you're running five thousand stores with one hundred twenty thousand employees, I mean, you're on the treadmill. You're on the hamster wheel every day, and uh, no matter how hard you try to be good to people and loving and win-wins, um, you're still on the hamster wheel. And it takes a toll on your spirituality. It takes mm -hmm. a toll on your emotionality. Because when you're making that kind of money and you're on the TV every 10 minutes, you know you don't know why people are around you. Are they around you for the right reasons? Or are they around you because you're you know successful and Papa John? So it was, it was time for a break. Well, let's start at the beginning, and we'll work our way yeah. to uh, five minutes ago. You start off in Indiana, right? Yeah. Your dad has a tavern. Yeah. And what's the tavern? I mean, they're serving <laughs> booze, but they're serving tavern food? Um, plate lunches. Mm -hmm. We did um, $2 McBurgers. I'm saying $1 McBurger. Uh, get a McBurger and a beer for a dollar. Mm -hmm. 50 cent game of pools. Um, it, was, it was rough. It was a uh, biker joint. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of fights, a lot of uh, drinking, mm -hmm. um, rough, but uh, we were good at it. I just didn't like the uh, bar business because of all the alcohol. Mm -hmm. So you start Papa John Pizza out of kind of the back room there? Yeah. yeah, we thought, okay, if we sell 50 cent beers with a $1 McBurger, uh, with a $5 pizza. I'm, I'm sorry, what's a McBurger? McBurger is um, two beef patties. Mm -hmm. Two slices of cheese, uh, tomato, lettuce, mayonnaise, um, and a little uh, seasoning. And that's a McBurger. That's a McBurger. Get a is, McBurger and a beer for a dollar. Is that a common thing to your dad's bar, or is it an Indiana thing? No, it was called. It was Mick's Lounge, so it was a McBurger. Oh, oh Mick. Oh, it was Mick's Lounge. <laughs> After a guy sorry. named Mick. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Now Daddy's partner it. was named Mick. Oh, okay, now yeah. I got it. Yeah. All right, so you go in the back, and you're like, well, I'm— I'm going to start some pizza back here. Yeah. We thought we had the pizza business uh, figured out because I made pizzas through high school, made pizzas in college, and thought I knew the best recipes and the best way to make it and bake it and get rid of it, uh, you know, quickly and get it out the door. Making pizza in high schools. Yeah. It's a little mm -hmm. different. Most people don't do that. Was it a thing where it's like you just make it for your family? We, what's mm -hmm. your family's heritage? Well, we're, um, uh, I'm from Biden, Germany. 1867, my great grandfather came over on a book, a boat called the Rosnick. So, Biden, Germany. Um, I'm one percent Italian, <laughs> mostly uh, north uh, northwest of uh, uh, Germany. Right. But hey, you don't have to be French to be a good lover. <laughs> I, listen, I'm I'm 50 percent Italian, but I'd never made pizza in high school. So you made it in high school, like for your friends for parties. Would you sell it, like? No, um, I started as a dishwasher at Rocky Sub Pub under Joe, John, and Frank Fondrisi. Real Italians, authentic. And they knew good Italian food. You mm -hmm. know, um, I hated washing dishes, and right across from where I washed the dishes is where Frank Fondrisi made pizzas. And I aspired and dreamt of one day getting to make pizzas. And finally, they got so busy, they had some write ups in the local newspaper that they blew the doors off the place. And uh, I got to graduate from washing dishes to making pizzas at 15 years old, and I fell in love with it. I knew that's what I wanted to do. I liked everything about it. Yeah. It's one thing to have a passion for making something or doing something or creating something, but then 
growing it into what'd you say about five thousand franchise? Yes, yes. At, at a certain point, that seems out of your pay grade when you were in high school. <laughs> I mean, it didn't seem like you had that background. You, your dad's got the got the pub. Your mom does what? Well, mom was a clerk at the county clerk's office for three hundred bucks every two weeks, and dad was an attorney and he had mixed lounge on the side. But um, I just loved pizza. I love making the dough. I love the sauce. I love the taste of the sauce. I love putting it together. I uh, used to uh, date a girl uh, in high school, Kelly Noel, and she would come in and I would write, I love you and pepperonis on the pizza. I mean, I just, I like pizza. It brought friends and family together and it was what I wanted to do with my life. So you start making it out of your dad's pub and, mm-hmm. and what's the initial reaction? Not good. Um, <laughs> not good at all at first. Um, I'd come up with the recipes and the name in 82, but I didn't found uh, the broom closet until 1984. So I'd been two years without making any pizzas, and I was rusty Mm -hmm. and just really had lost my game, lost my touch. So it took two or three months to get get the thing up and going. We, I think two months, three months in, we did $200 on one Tuesday night. My brother and I were jumping up and down because we're in this broom closet with 200 bucks thinking we're rich. And now on a good Super Bowl Sunday day, we'll do $20 million. So it was um, – but back then, we just had two fundamental beliefs, you know, just make a good product, have passion, and make sure everybody around you wins, your suppliers, your employees, your franchisees, your communities. And we learned early on if you have a mutually beneficial relationship to all the parties, you and yourself will be successful in the end. So you're making pizzas. It's a uh, you know a little hit and miss, mm-hmm. but you have some good days in there. Uh, at some point, then you've got to break free of the closet where you're making the pizzas and get your first place. Yeah, the bar's doing quite well. We're doing almost a thousand bucks a week in pool table revenue. Um, the bar's doing seven grand a week selling fifty cent beer. So what's that? Fourteen thousand, and the broom closet's doing three thousand a week. So okay, we're busting at the seams. So we moved next door. Uh, it was contiguous to the mixed lounge was a, a vacant spot. OKFC uh, had a tile floor, which was a big deal because the tile floor was ten thousand bucks, which we didn't have ten thousand bucks back in those days. Right. And we were doing three grand a week. We moved next door, put a sign on the door, and sales went to nine thousand a week in two weeks. And we thought, wow. You put a sign on the front door; it really works. <laughs> that's how that's how neophyte novice, how right. uh, unsophisticated we were. We did not understand marketing. Right. So that's going well. What mm. is uh, what are they like in Indiana for pizza? I mean, you don't hear Indiana and pizza put together that often. You hear New York and Chicago and that kind of stuff. Now, interesting. You say that our supplier, our fresh pack tomato supplier, not paste. Uh, probably ninety percent of their business is uh, Chicago and New York. Mm -hmm. because it's twice the money for a fresh pack versus paste. And we did real well in the Midwest. And he would come and visit and go, nobody else does well in the Midwest. You know, I said, well, good, I'll take it. So we were kind of the pioneers to get fresh pack flavor to Midwest and the the Southwest. So versus a a can of tomato paste. Double. Double the money. Double. Uh, Versus fresh pack. What's fresh pack? Fresh pack is... um, you have, in our situation, maybe a $100 million uh, plant mm-hmm. in the middle of California, and they pack for about eight weeks. In the other 10 months of the year, that facility shuts down because the tomato is only ripe once a year. Other places, they put it in 55-gallon drums, railroad cars, and they reconstitute it throughout the year and add water. A tomato, when it comes off the vine, fights two things, time and temperature. So as soon as you take that tomato off the vine, you're losing flavor. Mm -hmm. You're losing the volatiles that make it taste good. So you need to get it from the vine to the can as quick as possible to get that fresh pack Papa John's uh, taste. And so you've taken over the KFC Mm -hmm. next door. Um, You're doing well now. You put a sign Mm -hmm. up. Um, Do you immediately think about franchise expanding? second locations two points to that i didn't like the bar business and by the time we got the first papa john's i realized i was making enough money in the pizza business that i could get out of the bar business so we sold the bar in 87 1987 which was about uh, two years after the first papa john's but i remember going down to the local dominoes now we're up to nine thousand a week dominoes down a great um grant plaza about two miles down the road i walk in i ask the manager i said what are you doing a week now, I'm 21 years old. I said, we're doing six a week. 
I said, we're doing 9,000 a week. And I thought to myself, if we can beat them in Jeffersonville, Indiana, then we can beat them in the whole world. Mm. I thought like that at 21. I don't know why. That's crazy. But we really thought if we had the best product, we had mutually beneficial relationships with our employees and everybody else, that we were going to beat everybody in the whole world. Did you have business acumen before that? Were you, you know, people in high school? I don't know. For some people, it's paper routes. For some people, it's starting a business when they're in high school or dog walking or or car washing service or something like that. Was it, was it, was it, was there a business background for you or was it all just sort of passion and pizza? Well, I had a degree in business at Ball State University, but there was nothing really from college that was applicable in running the business. It just wasn't, you know, there wasn't a whole lot there, but, um, I remember being 19 or 20, um, we was a good athlete, good student, but I always worked harder than the other kids. And I used to pray every night, just give me something I can do that I don't have to work so damn hard to be average. And, um, yeah, we had a grass cutting company when I was 10. We painted gutters when I was 12. We always had jobs. Um, we always earned. We always saved. That was kind of instilled uh, in us from uh, my parents and grandparents. But I got in that bar. We're $64,000 in bankruptcy uh, Labor Day weekend of 83. And within a week, I'm, I'm looking at data. I said, we'll fix this. I can fix it. I can do, I don't know. It was just intuitive. It was just like a, really a, a blessing that, okay, you know, you're not good at this. You're not good at that. You're okay at this, but you can run a business. So the, I don't know if it's genetic. I don't know if it's just innate. I don't know if it's because I've been working since I was seven years old, but something about a business just clicked. And we had that bar out of bankruptcy selling 50 cent beers by uh, January 1st of 84. So you um, have your first take over the KFC. You're doing nine grand a week versus six with the closest Domino's franchise. Domino's, I guess, is pretty big back then. I'm, I'm trying to think how big Domino's was in 87 or about that, that time. I mean, 80, that would have been 85. 85. So we, they had to be over 5,000 stores, so they were big. Oh, they were yeah, big. Yeah, Monaghan was still involved in that, and I know he got that over 5,000 stores. There's only two or three founders that have taken their chains over 5,000 stores, and Tom was one of them. So you start setting your goals on, let's open a second store? Immediately. And how do you, all right, so first things you have to go, well, we have to find it's got to be close enough but not too close but far enough not yeah. to compete with one another like how far what's the distance i mean there's yeah, rules <laughs> i mean i know there's like franchise rules you know i don't know porsche will have it they'll go you cannot open another porsche right. dealership within you know 14 miles of the other one because they don't want to compete with themselves essentially Right. So for you, you go, we got to find another location. Well, we were lucky because um, Louisville, Kentucky is next to Lexington, which is up the road from Columbus, Ohio. If you look at the amount of fast food places between Columbus, Ohio, let's go through it. Just off the top, White Castle, Bob Evans, Long John Silver's, Donato's, Texas Roadhouse, KFC, Papa John's, Chi-Chi's, Wendy's, Rally's. It. For some reason, 90, 90 plus percent of the fast food companies come from that corridor. So if you're successful in Columbus, Ohio, Lexington, Kentucky, and Louisville, and or Evansville, Indiana, you've usually got something that is a national chain. So it was part of our DNA in that area to franchise. We just, you know, Jim Patterson with Long John Silver's, he franchised. K- uh, John Y. Brown with KFC, he franchised. So that was just part of what we knew we wanted to do from the get-go. Uh, Scott Roloff, our first franchisee, uh, 1986. Uh, we just set it up immediately to uh, be a franchise organization. We always had the capital, for the most part. We always had the institutional knowledge, the expertise. The one thing we we lacked is management. You know, you can only you're only as good as the people in your restaurants, and that was the part that we uh, we couldn't keep up with. So, in order to order to solve for that, we franchised. As far as the radius around the store. <clears throat> you make a great point. You want to make sure those areas touch each other Mm -hmm. because you leverage marketing, you leverage uh, supervising the restaurant, you leverage your distribution company, et cetera, et cetera. So we made sure that Jeff and Clarksville, New Albany were all about 15 minutes apart drive time, but they actually touched in the circles. 
And by the end of 86, we owned Southern Indiana. It was kind of like its own little um, niche market. Uh, it was north of the Ohio River. Uh, the knobs blocked it on the other side. So we, we owned that corridor by the end of 1986. How'd the Peyton Manning relationship come about? I mean, we've all <laughs> seen the commercials and remember the commercials, NFL and all that stuff. <laughs> You know, we met at a bowling function up in Indianapolis and just hit it off and went to dinner and then met with him and Ashley and, you know, we hit it off and then uh, he had the falling out with the Colts and went to dinner. What year was that? Sorry. Approximately. I think you're looking at 09, 2010, somewhere in there. We started, Mm -hmm. went went to Denver and we, he franchised Denver. Um, Denver was doing like, let's say. 14 a week, and when Peyton came to town, all of a sudden went to 20 a week. So that was very uh, lucrative, that franchise. He goes to Denver, and then, you know, I think, what, all four years he got in the playoffs? First year he went to the – I think the first year he went to the Super Bowl Mm -hmm. up in uh, New York. Um, You know, he gets an MVP, then he wins the Super Bowl. It was like a dream, you know, but it was just serendipitous. He liked me, and I liked him, and it worked. It seems it's uh, interesting to see – the Mannings, especially Eli, when they do their Monday night football coverage, <laughs> like they were always kind of, I don't know what to call them. Their, their personalities were not big, funny, and bold. They seem, especially Eli, seemed pretty, pretty straight laced guy, didn't seem to be particularly humorous. And all of a sudden, they've both gotten really funny yeah. and sort of come out of their shells. Do you think? That was always in them, and it just kind of came out because now they can because they don't feel like it's as buttoned down as it was when they were playing, or I don't know what I don't know what Peyton Manning's like, you know, off the field yeah. at dinner, yeah. funny guy, have a few drinks, have a laugh. Peyton's a real funny guy, um, and a lot of fun to be with. Um, very dry sense of humor. The funny one in that group is Cooper, the you know, third brother, the oldest. The oldest, so, right? Um, and uh, they're they're fun together because they kind of you know they Bust chuck each other's each other. balls. Yeah, they, right? They, they, yeah, absolutely. But the family is just really cool and really solid. Um, Archie and Olivia are salt of the earth. Um, and um, man, some of the licks that family's taken, you know, to get to where they're at. It's been pretty incredible. Um, with Peyton not going to Ole Miss, that in itself was was really rough. Yeah, um, Archie was uh, Archie Manning was played for the Saints for years. I don't know how many teams. I think he, I knew him as a Saint growing up, just the Saints. And uh, he was a good quarterback in the NFL, the dad. And then he went to Ole Miss. And yeah. then the whole idea was his son had to go to Ole Miss, but <laughs> his son didn't go to. I mean, Peyton now Eli went to Ole Miss, right? right? But Peyton didn't go to Ole Miss. And uh, you know, I'm from the San Fernando Valley. I'm from mm-hmm. California. I never went to college. That stuff doesn't mean much out here, but Uh, in his neck of the woods, especially if your dad's Archie Manning, that stuff means something. And I don't even, I don't even know why Peyton went to Tennessee, right? Well, the speed limit at Ole Miss is 18 miles an hour after Archie Manning. So they just assume since Cooper went there, Cooper Mm -hmm. was a great uh, receiver Uh and then had some, uh, some injuries that prohibited him from keep playing and they just assumed that Peyton was going to go, and then he went to Tennessee. And so that was like the worst thing that could have happened to Ole Miss. And um, I think the Rebels rebelled. And then um, uh, Eli came in, went there, and uh, made everything good again. So the 18 miles an hour went back up. So now the speed limit's still 18 miles an hour. I don't know if that's after Peyton or after Archie, but I think it's after Archie, but yeah. So but, so you're we're, we're here in the mid-'80s franchising is is happening Mm -hmm. you're still a young man Mm -hmm. early 20s and it's it's going according to plan at this at this point yeah i mean you have the bumps you have the ups and downs you're always out of capital and when you're an entrepreneur you know um you're allergic to um patients and we were allergic Mm -hmm. to patients so you're always out of cash and so we ran it up to about 250 stores, give or take, and took her public in 1993, raised like 25 million bucks, and then the game was over. So we went from 1993, 250 stores, to the turn of the century, 2,000 stores. 
is the uh, we saw some of it. I think in the movie The Founder with the yeah. uh, Croc Croc uh, McDonald story, like is kind of the goal to just have the exact same experience at every franchise. I mean, you couldn't tell the difference between a slice of pizza from this location to that location. The menu's the same. Everything is the same. Is that kind of the challenge or the goal? The brilliance behind what Croc did was QSC and V, quality service, you know, cleanliness and value. I mean, he stuck to that. And then... um, Croc had a saying, your quality is only as good as your consistency. Incongruity breeds mistrust in the food service industry. The problem with Croc is, back to our early conversation, he wanted to make sure everybody made money. As long as you follow QSC and V, you could be part of the team. He had some rich doctors and lawyers get involved, and they didn't want to be in that restaurant. And that drove Croc nuts, and they had a falling out over all that. But Croc's problem was he only charged a half percent royalty, so he couldn't really put in the infrastructure and the administrative aspect of the business to get McDonald's to where it um, should be. And he hired a CFO named uh, Harry Stuborn, and Harry Stuborn's the one that came up with, with, we'll buy the building, you know, we'll buy the property, we'll build the building, you buy the equipment, you just pay us 10% of your gross. And that was the formula that put McDonald's on the map, and to this day has made them the richest restaurant company in the world by far. I mean, I think their market cap's like $130 billion. We need to look that up. I mean, Papa John's is $5 billion. You know, Yum's maybe. I mean, McDonald's is bigger than everybody else just about put together. And that's because uh, Harry Stuborn, the CFO of McDonald's, uh, got crocked to say, hey, let's just build the building and uh, buy the property. Am I right? Uh, I mean, no, you, you follow this subject closely. Did... McDonald's kind of fall out of favor sort of a few years ago and they're back now. If I'm, you know, it's a proper description of it, or is that just kind of me? I'm, I'm trying to think. Cause you know, you have, you know, when I was a kid going to McDonald's was the biggest treat in the world. And then at a certain point you have kids and going to McDonald's for them is not the biggest treat in the world. It's not the same as it was, but and I don't know if anything had to do with the pandemic or anything, but is McDonald's bigger now than they were five years ago, or did they slack off for a little while? This has been an interesting exercise. I'm a uh, friend's acquaintances with the franchisee number eight of McDonald's in Tampa, Florida. Um, name's Blake. And his grandfather used to make the suits for Croc. And so when I found this out through a mutual friend, Jordan Zimmerman, I'm like, you got the guy that was there when Croc was alive. I mean, you know, I just, I'm all ears with this guy and um, third generation. And uh, so they've seen the ups and downs. Um, but the thing that's happened at McDonald's the last two years <clears throat> is they can't, none of us in the restaurant industry can really get good team members right now because, you know, they're paying people to stay at home, which we'll talk about later. And when you incentivize people to stay at home, they don't work. I mean, it's it's human nature. Right. And, they can't hire. You say team members, but employees. If people to show up and work there. Right. right. People are not going to come to work because it's hard work if you're going to pay them to stay home. That's human nature. It's it's not that bad people are lazy. It's just, you know, you're paying them to stay home, so they're going to stay home. Well, I, I think, and you tell me, I used to work at a McDonald's <laughs> in <laughs> Studio City. It's not there anymore, by the way. I don't know why they got rid of the one on, it was on Ventura Boulevard in Studio City, but, um, you know, it, it's not, look, if you paid me to stay home, I wouldn't stay home yeah. because I don't work at a McDonald's. But yeah. when I was working at a McDonald's, if you paid me the same or more, I would stay home because mm-hmm. I didn't yeah. want to flip burgers all day. But what you're doing is you're kind of robbing people that experience yeah. of work, you know, their first job for a lot of people. I think, you know, McDonald's is a, you know, when, when I interview successful people and I do all the time, I'd say about 55% of them say my first job is at a McDonald's right. and they got kind of their ethic and their sort of the rhythm of work at a young age. Now, part of the problem is when people go, well, you're a mother of three and uh, you're 40 year old and, uh, you know, how are you going to live off of McDonald's wages? And my answer is you're not supposed to be working at a McDonald's when right. you're mother of three and you're 40. But we can circle back to that. But cause I do want to I am interested in the economy and, and how that works. So McDonald's is having trouble growing now because it can't put enough human beings in, in 
there's just not the workforce? No, I think McDonald's is still growing. But back to your point on work ethic and uh, happiness, how the framers in the Declaration, declaration Life, Liberty, Pursuit of Happiness, what do they mean by that? And all the studies they've done in all these fancy universities and consultants and institution is happiness is the ability to overcome a difficult task. You know, the glory, the fulfillment of putting in a good day's work and being good at what you do. And how they figured that out back in, you know, 1775, 1776, I'll never know. But I think when you you do pay, pay people not to work and you don't expect them to, to do their best and you don't see the best in them, I think that's disrespectful. You know, I think we all, you know, I, I don't know of anyone – big corporation that didn't start out with one operation or one person. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I think we all start out at McDonald's. I started out at Rocky Sub Pub. And I think it's that um, learning how to earn. I started out at 235 an hour, learning how to save and to be able to buy nice things and be accountable and be prosperous and to make a contribution to your fellow man. I think that the intangibles are just as important as the money. Well, this is a thing I was thinking about because I think I'm looking at Chris. I think uh, Andrew Yang is coming in here maybe later in the week or something like that. Tomorrow. Oh, well, there you go. Tomorrow. And, you know, he's a big universal income guy. And I like Andrew Yang, but I, I think the politicians and a, a lot of the news agencies and the public at large have missed something about working and it's, it's going to be a big issue, which is they've kind of cut out the middleman. They go, why do you work? And they go, well, to earn money. Oh, okay. But what if we just then gave you the money? We could save you the work. And it's like, no, no, you've missed all the other things you get from working. And they, they sort of look at it as you work to get money. So if we just gave you the money, then you'd have all the benefit of working. And it's like, no, you mm -hmm. no, you would not. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, when they talk about, taking a grain or taking a vegetable and, you know, stripping away all the fiber and all the nutrients and all everything. And then at the end, you just have grape juice. Well, it's not really that good for you. You need the skin and you need the husk and you need the fiber and you need the other parts that are in there. And that's kind of what my metaphor for work is. It's the money, sort of the end result. You're missing the whole ride right. and then the experience and then how you atrophy when you don't work. Yes. It, it'll cut you off at the knees. And I don't know why we don't understand that a little better as a society. So, yeah, paying people to stay home is going to ruin the people you're trying to help. Yeah. Well, on a micro level, uh, we, us as human beings, form habits in about 20 days. Mm -hmm. And the paying people home not to work and incentivizing them to not be productive has been going on for over a year. So this is a very dangerous, uh, potentially, and interesting um, test in psychology. Um, and I hope that when we stop the incentives not to work, I hope people go back to work just out of um, you know sheer uh, desire to you know have have nice things and have abundance. But the this is the greatest country in the world when it comes to the citizens benefiting from free markets. Free markets are basically uh, they want to call it capitalism. Capitalism is just voluntary exchange. You know you you know it's freedoms and anytime you tamper with freedoms, so free markets are ecosystems that do have equilibriums. And when you start messing with equilibriums you know, uh, this case labor, when you pay people to stay at home, you, you enter, you mess with the, the dynamics of supply and demand. And when you mess with those, you're talking about socialism, fascism to an extent, <clears throat> there is a difference there. But you, when you do that, goods and services, the quality goes backwards. So, you know, you look at the container ships, you look at, uh, you can't get through a McDonald's, you can't get through a Starbucks, you know, because they can't get employees, you have all these unintended consequences by messing up free market dynamics with regard to labor. And that's just one attribute of a free market society. Yeah, I've always kind of said that capitalism, or what you just discussed, it's not really a system. It's just kind of what happens when you get out of the way. It's just, a, it's what happens. Oh. It's somebody has some pelts, the other person's cold, the other person yes. has some food, you know, they trade. It's just kind of what happens. You know, we act like it's oh. a system that a 
bunch of, you know, rich white guys yes. are, you know, are smashing the citizens down with. But it's really just kind of what happens. And then when the government gets too involved with what happens, then they screw up what happens. Yeah. yeah anytime you overregulate or you start messing with supply and demand dynamics or free markets, anytime you uh, intervene on freedoms, any kind of freedom, freedom of speech, freedom to purchase something, you know, freedom to buy property, individual property rights, then the the system uh, gets hurt. And so people ask me what, you know, I would do today for small business. One, I'd less regulations. Uh, two is less taxes. Three is I would stop playing with these pipelines and, and lower the price of gas. Um, I'd get supply and demand back in equilibrium with labor so that goods and services and commodities aren't so high. And then I'd get the heck out of the way of the small business owner because entrepreneurship in this country is alive and well. And you can't stop an entrepreneur. They they just they love it. If they have a taste of prosperity, they multiply it. And it's the backbone. Sixty percent of the new jobs are entrepreneurs, the small business owners. So we this administration seems to be the policy seem to be anti small business. And that's the worst thing you can do to get this economy back not on its feet is to hurt that small business owner. Well, tell me what you think of this idea, because it makes me think about it. So every administration, including the current administration, I go, oh, we love small business. We're all positive for small business. We're big fans of small business. But if you really think about it, they're the government and they want to grow the government. That is not small business. That is the opposite of small business. So it's almost like saying, um, it's almost like saying, you know, I make Budweiser, you make Coors. I'm pro Coors. I love Coors. That's like, well, do you? You're Budweiser. You know what I mean? You just keep growing. You're you're the government, and it's sort of like, at least out here, it's like school teachers and school teachers unions and school boards and that whole big monopoly. They're like, oh, we love kids. We love kids. We, kids are number one. Right. But you don't want any competition. No, no. We'll handle the kids. It's like, well, so are you pro, pro kids? Yeah, we're pro kids. Are you pro school choice? No, we're not. Well, which is it? Yeah. Because school choice benefits kids. So do you love kids or are you trying to grow your own? Meaning, are you trying to just get the unions bigger and the boards bigger? Because that's what it seems like you're doing. And so the government says, we love small business, but now we're going to do a whole bunch of crap that flies in the face of small businesses, and it's going to grow us. The government, the ultimate big business, is government. And so maybe they're not even that interested in now what they don't figure out is government doesn't create money. It just spends the money. So you need the tax revenues from the small businesses. But it seems like you're more big government than small business. Well, it's what language do you speak to someone who uh, won't think? I mean, you know, when you, you, okay, I'm going to defund the police. Okay, defund the police. Well, somebody's breaking my house. Well, I mean, do you want police? You know, you know what I mean? The, the whole thing is, uh, it's a pseudo uh, solution. And the beautiful thing about um, the folks on the right is at least they, they stand for something. You know, one day on the left, it's woke, then it's cancel culture, then it's an open border, then a closed border. Then I mean, it's just, you know, we, we want the, the school system. And, and the, the, the parents are getting a good taste of what it's like to speak up against the ideology of the elite progressive left. Because they will attack you if you disagree with their ideology. And I think that they've overstepped their bounds with the parents. Um, But that's, you know, um, that, you know, if you take, there was a broadcaster last week that had, I think, Biden's daughter's diary. They raided, the FBI raided his house at, you know, five in the morning. The, if you disagree with the elite progressive. Yeah, Project Veritas. Yeah. Um, Yeah. uh, Take uh, Portnoy. I mean, take Gruden. I mean, if you disagree with the elite progressive, you're going to get, you're going to get attacked, whether you're a parent, a business owner or a coach. No, I, I know it's, it's scary times always, by the way, led by the people that never stop complaining about McCarthyism, Hmm. led by that exact same group who've made movies about the evils of McCarthyism and written books about the evils of McCarthyism. The second you step out of line and say something they disagree with, they want you removed, shut down, silenced, and 
uh, removed from your livelihood, which is about the worst thing you can do. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, in a world where people don't get stoned to death anymore or put to death anymore, at least a society, uh, about the worst thing you can do to somebody like a John Gruden is remove them. Mm -hmm. Essentially that's a death. You well, can't, you can't lynch him, but you can kill him mm -hmm. by removing him from this thing. He's his passion about his life yeah. and his, and in his way of yeah. making money. Well, questioning curiosity and we'll take that at a macro if you can think up the question out in the universe somewhere there's the answer the most important thing you can have as an entrepreneur is your independent critical judgment all great products are guys or, or women that thought about doing something a little differently they question the status quo so if you're not questioning then you don't have curiosity if you don't have curiosity you're not going to have new innovations new products better ways to do things. And my biggest issue with the progressive elite, because I don't want to confuse uh, the folks that wake up every day and make our country great. I don't want to want to confuse that with the folks that are really making things happen at the top, the progressive elite left. But if you disagree with their ideology and you've got any kind of clout or celebrity or notoriety or an intelligence, uh, they're going to, they're going to try to do what they did to Gruden and uh, Portnoy. I mean, it just, they're going to, they're going to go for the juggler. It, and that's, that's just, uh, I think Gruden called it what socialist or uh, Soviet kind of tactics. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's nasty. Look, I've, I've been saying, like a, like a broken record for years, Portnoy is from Barstool Sports. They did a hit piece on him, trying to get him the sponsors removed and so on and so forth. He's fighting back. Uh, you cannot apologize to this group. Everyone would say to me, oh. when's it going to stop? I said, when people stop apologizing. There is no, you know, Gruden suing the NFL, Portnoy's on a campaign. <laughs> calling out the people that wrote the article on him and he's fighting back. That's the only way. That's the only way it stops. Um, Adam, I would be a dead man if I didn't have that tape. Cancel culture would have killed me. They would have canceled me, but I have the tape. Well, yeah. I want to talk about that and you and your trials and tribulations and cancel culture. Uh, first, well, let's talk about uh, a business. Tommy John, end of the year, starting now. Mad dash toward the new year. Most people uh, love the holiday season, and uh, Tommy John does too. It's also the softness season. Starts with a new pair of Tommy Johns. I'm wearing mine right now. Breathable, lightweight, moisture-wicking fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands. Feel the same comfort wearing their luxurious soft loungewear on top. It is so comfortable. It's so good-looking. You'll want to wear it outside. You'll want to sleep in it. Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. Over 16 million pairs sold. I All I'll tell you is once you get into the Tommy John, you'll never go back to what you currently are wearing. Best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free. Guarantee. Right, Dawson? Get 20% off your first order right now at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. That's TommyJohn.com slash Adam for 20% off. TommyJohn.com slash Adam. See site for details. All right. So we will uh, take a quick break. We'll come back with John, and we'll talk about the attempt, and possibly successfully, of his uh, cancel culture on him, and we'll do that right after this. Uh, I think people have some recollection of Papa John getting in a little scrape at the NFL <laughs> and then getting uh, getting sort of ousted from his own company with a tape and a, a comment and controversy and cancel culture, but why don't you walk us through that? Because I think most people, we don't have enough hard drive to remember all the nuts and bolts of every case. Yeah, you know, back to our conversation, we got Peyton. We're the number one sponsor of the NFL by far. I mean, most of them have like a five or a six or a four. We had a 62. So we're number one. What's Peyton, a 62? Sorry. 62 is the rating they give you as the fans' most favorite or liked sponsor of the NFL. So I think it was Papa John's was 62. And then I think Verizon or Budweiser was 40, and then it drops down to 20. Mm -hmm. And then most most of the sponsors are less than five. So, so we're going back to what year here? We're talking 2015, 2016. All right. so, yeah, 17. Papa John's, ubiquitous. It's all over. It's all I watch on. NFL every Sunday. There's Papa John's. There's yeah. you. There's right. Peyton Manning. Right. All right. Then we have the controversy come up. And uh, it, it alienated um, 
you know, the fan base. Uh, and it hurt all the sponsors sales. Is that the Kaepernick take the a Kaepernick. knee stuff? So now there's the take a knee stuff and you've now sort of politicized football and they're losing some ratings. You've, Big time, 20%. 20% down in ratings. And Papa John's franchisees had probably 35 or 40% of their year spent in the NFL. So we have a big chunk of our eggs in this one basket called the NFL. And Goodell, who I was hammered on, wasn't taking care of the players and wasn't solving this to the players and owner satisfaction. Right. And, and so the, and also you're paying for the advertising. So is there a uh, tell me if this is a an analogy that works for you. Um, somebody says, look, here's a billboard up on the freeway and we get a million cars passing it every day. And you go, okay, I'll, I'll pay the rate for that billboard. And then at some point, they start putting some cones out and doing some construction up the road, and they narrow it down to two lanes, and now you only have 700,000 people going by. And so if you bought the billboard, you're going, hey, what happened here? Yeah. Is that kind of See, kind pa- of analogous? <clears throat> well, Papa John's, exactly. Papa John's is really a family of small businesses. Let me explain. We have thousands of stores, but the average – franchisee is two, three, four, maybe five stores. So it's a family of small businesses. And when they pay for the billboard, I in this case NFL, and their sales go backwards, not forwards, you're going to hear about it as a franchisor. So the franchisees, this was going into the second year, uh, Roger Goodell, we felt, was being uh, irresponsible and not being accountable on getting this solved to the uh, player satisfaction. I called him out on it. And if you call Roger Goodell out on anything, he's he's pretty thin skinned. He's not thin. He's pretty. He's real thin skinned. You know, he kind of has this emperor with no clothes. This, you know, and so here I'm a pizza guy saying I don't care if you're Roger Goodell. I don't care if you, you know who you are. You're hurting my small business owners. And so we called him out. Called him out on earnings call and said, Hey, you got to get this resolved. This is a how did you call him out? I said this is a debacle. This did you physically have... call him or no? No, call... an earnings call. Uh, earnings calls. They asked why sales were down. I said sales were down oh, because okay. the NFL debacle, the way Roger Goodell's handled it. Mm-hmm. This should have been solved to the owners and players' satisfaction over a year ago. Right. He didn't like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, we're, are we because I don't think everyone fully understands what's going on right now, which is sort of speak out against certain people and then they'll put a hit on you. We were talking about Dave Portnoy from Barstool Sports. It's like, first off, we're not even sure what his politics are. We're just sure he doesn't play around. I mean, he doesn't get manipulated by the game. Meaning the new world order is, is there's going to be a couple of tastemakers up there, you know, whoever, LeBron James, Barack Obama, and they're going to tell you how to think. And if you don't think that way, then people are going to come after you right. and we're going to remove you from your livelihood. Goodell's right. one of those guys. The NFL's one of those guys. You start going afoul of them. They don't just look the other no. way. They they get rid of you. Yeah. This is not a difficult story to track. Roger Goodell set me up as a racist through laundry service to get rid of me because I was on his case. He set you up as a racist. Yeah, he and Washerman. Washerman's the one that taped the call, reversed what I said, ran it to Forbes. Washerman and Goodell are best friends. Washerman owned the advertising agency that was doing Papa John's work. So he tapes the franchisees. No, he call? no he tapes the call with me uh, and other laundry service executives. Tries I'm sorry, to, what's laundry service? Laundry service is the ad agency for Papa John's, who was supposed to enhance the reputation of Papa John's and supposed to enhance mm-hmm. my reputation. Instead, they're working under the scenes. Per Goodell and Watchman to try to get me to say something, um, you know, that was pro- provocative or um, negative. Right. They ran a partial clip, partial truth to Forbes. Forbes didn't fact check. The rest of the media rushed to judgment. And before you know it, they blow me up on a false narrative. That was all Goodell. And that's Goodell's pattern. Remember, you look at Gruden, you look at Richard with the Panthers, Panthers color. I mean, if you disagree with Goodell, and in this case, the night before the conference call that um, we were talking about earlier, Jerry Jones with the Cowboys called me. Dan Snyder with the Redskins called me. They wanted Goodell out. They wanted me to attack Goodell, 
Roger Goodell, on the call, the earnings call the next day. I said, hey, you guys want to personalize this. I just want the matter resolved. But Goodell was feeling heat from other owners and now from the number one sponsor. So what's his way to get around it? Set the guy up as a racist. Right. So it's already – now, by the way, this is the fastest way to get rid of somebody – who's an enemy essentially is to turn them into a racist. Yes. Now I have no idea why society just bites on it every time. Like, Oh, that guy's or Oh, Gruden's a racist. <laughs> Gruden's a racist. <laughs> like you could be a racist and work, yeah. you know, 72% of the NFL's African American, like as if Gruden could pull that off in Tampa yeah. or, or you know, Oakland right, right. or wherever Vegas, you know, but all right, everyone's a racist. Fine. Uh, but that's the fastest way to put a hit on someone is to make them a racist. Well, there's two ways. You you can put a hit on someone by calling them a racist, or you can put a hit on someone, this is the Dave Portnoy thing, yeah. by basically calling them a rapist. So it's 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 one or the other. And we'll pick and choose. If you're a single guy who likes the lady, says Portnoy, we'll work we'll work the rapist right. angle. If you're a religious guy who's happily married, we'll work the racist angle. We'll right. we'll figure out mm-hmm. what angle we can most easily kind of right. shoehorn into this. But it'll be one or the other. It'll be racist or rapist. Those are two angles. Cool. And then we'll get you canceled. And you know, the LA Times, the New York Times, CNN. Like lap dogs, they'll just dive right on top yes. of it. Like, hey, here you go. Here's the bait. Hey, hey, CNN, do your job. What? Right. Do what we tell you to do. Hey, LA Times, wake up. Do mm. your job. We're calling this guy a racist. Good, jump in. Here we right. go. We got a black guy, Larry Elder, who's trying to be the governor of California. Mm. Let's make him uh, the new uh, white face of black racism or the wh- black face of white racism, or whatever it is. He's a racist. Go ahead. Right. There you go. Right. Do your job, Times. Right. They don't do their job. Their job's to investigate. Right. But they just do the bidding of everybody. And then the stupid people watch it and they don't understand what's going on. They go, oh, wait, that's a middle-aged black guy. Right. But he's a racist? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I'll just go along with this. Like idiots. You people don't understand what's going on around them, which is insane to me. They're mostly scared. Yeah. They're like, ah, I don't the cool people at the party think he's a racist. I don't want to be called a racist sympathizer, so I'll just go along. So you defy Goodell. Well, you got, you got Goodell who watches Washman's kids. Goodell, uh, Washman refers to Goodell as his big brother. That's the ad agency. That's the ad agency. So you've got Goodell gets with Washman, said we got to set this guy up. We got to shut him up. We got to get rid of him. And then you got Papa John's board of directors. Whether they were passive or active, they were complicit. They didn't do an investigation. They just stuck around for two weeks and got the tape. So you got your own ad agency who's in bed with Goodell, who is, you think, is working with you. Yes. But they're working with Goodell. Yes. They were, they were paid $5 million to handle the account and to embellish and enhance the reputation. Instead, they're working behind the scenes to try to set it up. I mean, in Gruden's case, you have an a email paper trail or text paper trail. Right. In this case, there's no nothing like that except there's a setup. So it's actually more egregious than the Gruden thing, which is plenty gr- egregious in itself. Well, and the Gruden, all right, why did they want to get rid of Gruden? Because he, he hates Goodell. Same reason they want to get us rid of Snyder. If you look at the investigative report on the Redskins, the only two people they're really looking at are Snyder, who hates Goodell, and Gruden. Right. So the Gruden thing, they're doing an investigation on the Redskins. 12 years ago. Right. And they pull up like 650,000 emails or something. I don't know. Some, don't you know. can look it up, Chris. There's some insane number of emails looking into the Redskins. They find a couple with Goodell's name on it and they get rid of Goodell. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. They get rid of Gruden. They get Gruden. rid of Gruden. They find a couple with Gruden's name out of the 650,000 emails, find a couple with Gruden, hmm. and they use it to get rid and, of Gruden. And they'll get rid of Snyder, too. I don't think they'll get rid of Jones, but they'll get rid of Snyder. Jerry since, Jones. Jerry Jones with the Cowboys. I don't think they'll get rid of Jerry Jones, but Dan Snyder, I mean, sexual harassment's probably one of his least problems and what they're going to come up with, but but uh, he doesn't like Goodell. He, uh, he's very uh, vocal about that. Goodell doesn't like him, and Goodell, you know, he's got a sight on uh, Dan Snyder, and Snyder probably won't be part of the NFL, you know, soon to be. So 650,000 emails, they find a hand, I don't know, a couple from Gruden, and they weren't even investigating Gruden. No. So now you're 
PR company <laughs> is working <laughs> with Goodell. Yes. And uh, Goodell says, uh, we got to get rid of Papa John. Yeah. So there's a phone call and what is said, it, which is recorded. And the phone call, what happens in the phone call? Well, the, the phone call was secretly recorded. That turned out to be the best thing that could have happened because they took the comments out of context and out of contrast and they left the tape running after I hung up. Mm-hmm. And they all talked about why they did, you know, we hope he gets screwed. We hope he gets sent out to pasture. He won't have a job in a week. So they, they show the true motives after they hung up. So, so you think you're having a conference call with your PR team? Yes. And they're recording it. Didn't know they were recording it, but yes. Right, right. Which seems a little unusual. It was a setup. I mean, it's right. unequivocal. Washerman and laundry service set me up. There's unequivocal. That's the PR team. Where'd it come from? The, they, why, would it, why would an agency... S- set up a client well because goodell instructed washington to do it the problem is i had a weak board you know papa john's they panicked everyone you know they're by caves they didn't do a proper investigation which they they broke just about every law in delaware that you can possibly break the biggest decision this board of directors has ever made they didn't do not do do, they did no deliberation no thought and you have to have a duty of care. You have to to think things through. And they skipped the investigation um, and got themselves, uh, the board of directors of Papa John's got themselves in a mess. So they, um, <clears throat> he records this conversation. Right. What's said in the conversation? Conversation is a history of um, the fam- my family treat everybody with kindness and respect. You know, that was just the way we were raised. Everybody is important. You know, everybody has got a special gift in life that they uh, need to explore and, um, you know, really grab a hold of and um, expand and excel. And we talk about my childhood and, and how I was raised and how it was just different in my household that you respect everybody, regardless of, you know, their gender, their nationality or the race. And that was just we, we hit that nail over and over again that um, I want Papa John's to be a company of diversity. You know, I want Papa John's to be the example of anybody can live the American dream. At the end, I quoted Colonel Sanders. I said, hey, you guys got to get off this because they were they were poking and poking. I said, you're missing the boat here. I said, Colonel so they were trying to bait yeah, you. They, they were goading me. Yeah, right. they, yeah, they were trying to get me to say anything. And Colonel Sanders is from Kentucky. He's a known racist. He was um, he abused the word. Um, and everybody, the N word, the N word abused it. I mean, mm-hmm. it was just, it was just part of his vocabulary because he looked at uh, blacks as second class citizens. Mm-hmm. And I said, Hey, this guy does this. I never do that. So you guys just need to stop even considering that that's even part of my nature or my personality. So the contrast, so Colonel Sanders uses the N word. I don't, I never do. Right. But you said it in the it tape. said the word, right. Colonel Sanders calls black people, the N word. I never use that word. They, that's enough for them. That's, well, they cut off, I never use the word, ran at the Forbes. So they took it out of context, and they didn't put out the contrast. The contrast is, this guy does it, we're never going to do it. Right. One founder does it, this founder would never do it. Right. That's enough. I mean, in today's, it's a, it, these are hatchet job, hit jobs. Mm-hmm. I don't think people understand that. I don't think they understand what's going on. Yeah. So uh, Forbes runs with it. It's a shit storm. Yeah. And, and, and then part two of what's going on, uh, and then the board doesn't stand up, which is, it's like NBC and Chris Harrison and The Bachelor. Hey, NBC, stand up. Would you grow a pair? This, this, you know, this, this Garrett. So there's two elements, and, and we need both of them to work in unison. We need the, Idiots that are doing the hit jobs on everybody or out there. It's clear what what's going on. That's only one part of it. The other part is the sponsors have to cave. The boards have to cave. Yeah. The networks have to cave. So you have this guy who hosts The Bachelor for 28 seasons. No problemo. He sort of half-heartedly defends somebody. He's not even involved with it himself. And you immediately cave and fire him. That's the second part that needs to happen. If that part stopped happening, then the hit jobs would stop. That's what people don't understand. It's the weakness 
and the cowardice of the boards and the networks and the sponsors that immediately cave over any controversy? Well, I think boards need to stick to what boards need to stick to, which is run the business. Let all this peripheral stuff, the politics, uh, woke, um, you know, CRT, all this. Let let that's not a board of directors' job. The board of directors' job is to make, you know, if you're selling Coca Cola, make the best beverages. If you're Delta, fly the best flights. If you're Papa John's, make the best pizzas. But for some reason, they get sucked into this, which is a losing battle. Which is why I'm so happy where I'm at today. Because my, in my shoes. I can be a employee. I can be a Rob Lynch or a Shaquille Neal, where I, you know, run the company, which I would want to do in this day and age. I don't want to be in a commercial for a hot camera for three days shooting a commercial. So, employee, I don't want to be that. Or oh, I could be a board of director. Well, I don't want to be a board of director in this day and age. It's the the liability and the vulnerability. So, where do you want to be? You want to be a shareholder. Let somebody else go out and deal with all this craziness and enjoy a market that's gone from nineteen thousand to what 36,000 in the last 20 months. The, you know, I think so my position is What do you mean a market that's gone from 19,000? Well, the Dow was at 19,000 20 months ago. Oh, the Dow. We're Dow, talking Dow, about. I'm sorry, right. Dow, we can do S&P, we can, whatever index you want to use. But, you know, let somebody else worry about the day-to-day nonsense with supply chain, uh, labor dynamics, yeah. all this po- well, political stuff. So coming full circle as we're as we're bringing this thing home. It's like I started with the CrossFit guy <laughs> like he just cashed out. He's about the same age as you, me. You know, he just cashed out. So it's the best thing that ever happened to him. Yeah. Like he, and, and also, how could you run a company in this day and mm-hmm. age of insane wokeness when you're just trying to run a yeah. business, you know, and everyone's infusing and grafting race and LGBT yeah. and everyone's just grafting it onto everything. You're trying to make pizzas or run CrossFit or whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever it is. So uh, you cash out or you, and... Well, the game, they're playing the game of the finite game of win lose, win lose. Everything's always win lose. Right. I'd rather play the infinite game of I am. Right. right. That never goes away. You know, uh, the the shield of making sure everybody wins together, mutually beneficial relationships, running your life on principles and values. I am. That's a much better infinite game, and you can never beat I am. You right. know, you can win some, you can lose some on a finite game, but you can never beat the infinite game of, of I am and. I feel really blessed to play the hand I get to play today. Yeah. So again, sort of blessing in disguise. You get to get off the out of the off the hamster wheel, cash out. You got more money than you can spend, but you can have fun <laughs> trying. <laughs> and and now you're just out. Now, so last question: Is it about reputation now? I mean, you've been smeared, tarnished. I feel um, like I'm indebted forever to the the black community and to my employees. We didn't have anybody that believed this this nonsense, this BS from the get go. And when you're sitting in the town square and people are throwing tomatoes at you, I mean, all I have to do is have one employee, one some, somebody that's a minority say, "Yeah, he did this, that, and the other," and they they said, "No, he was always good to me. He's always kind to me," and and I'm forever indebted to my employees and to my franchisees and to uh, the black community. And I'm a good guy uh, to have you owe money to. Um, and um, so I, I have four things, four rules. It's got to be in my soul, my next endeavor. It's got a better humanity. It's got to be scalable. I like big stuff, and I want it to be self, self-sustainable. And what I really like right now is this uh, concept of organic gardens and farms throughout the country, decentralized farming. That's mm. where my heart's at right now. So you're just going to take your experience, your expertise. And by the way, if people throw tomatoes at you, you're going to make a hell of a pizza sauce out of it. So they should think they should rethink well, that. Well, and it's fresh, fresh and it's it's fresh packed too. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just going to take your experience, your knowledge, your ability, your passion and just steer it toward this other subject. We'll see. I mean, again, you have to have three things in in business. You have to have a passion, your passion and what you do. You have to be best in the class. You're best in the class of what you do. And you have to have an economic model that makes money, which you make money, I'm sure. So as long as you have those three circles, you can make it as big as you want to make it. So I don't know. I, I just like the concept of decentralizing farmers, bringing things back where you're dependent on the, the ground, not some big you know, chemical or agricultural company. And you're making people's lives better and healthier. I like that concept. 
I like it too. All right, last sponsor, LifeLock. Tech support scams trick you into believing something is wrong, and then they steal your personal information, tap your bank account, or install dangerous software on your device. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. Every day, we put our info at risk on the internet. In an instant, cyber criminals could harm your finances, your credit, as well. Good thing there's LifeLock. LifeLock helps detect a wide range of identity threats like your social security number for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information, they will send you an alert. So protect yourself with the industry leader and the standard LifeLock. Right, Dawson? No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can keep what's yours with LifeLock Identity Theft Protection. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year with promo code ADAM. Call 1-800-LIFELOCK or head to LifeLock.com and use promo code ADAM for 25% off. So, John, should we... uh Tell people about your uh, Instagram. Uh, let's see, at the Papa John Schnatter is where you go for that. Anything else uh, you'd like me to give yeah, a plug TikTok to? TikTok and Instagram are at the Papa John Schnatter dot com, and uh, we have a lot of fun with it. You know, oh, we keep it. it we keep it apolitical and, and uh, much fun and uh, interesting. So it's a good time. Because this guy's got a problem with weed, like big, <laughs> big time. Jamaican? Come on. <laughs> and it's also, we don't really judge the, yeah, he's an Uber guy. Likes to, yeah. He likes to wake and bake and drive us to the airport. If you smelled scotch, yeah. you would like go, <laughs> what <laughs> is <laughs> up? <laughs> right? But, but here, oh, God, this guy likes to toke uh, out. He's going to hop while out. He, while he 